Hi everyone, my name is Peter Bell and I'm the Head of Online Instruction here at Flatiron School. Thanks very much for taking the time to join this webinar. And what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be taking a little bit of time to meet Flatiron School and talk about, I'll mention our in-person program, but I'll really be focusing on the online program, the kinds of uh, resources we provide in terms of instructional and other resources, the kinds of programming languages you learn, and then my goal is to make it probably a fairly short presentation and then to open it up for questions so if you'd like to know any more about the program, it'll be a chance for you to ask. I think the way, apologies, I don't use GoToWebinar, which is the tool we're using today so often, but it uh, looks like if nothing else, you should be able to set, be set up with the ability to ask questions. So what I'm going to suggest is, if you have questions, there's like a little questions tab and there's also a chat tab. Feel free to use either of those. Uh, I won't be keeping a, an active eye on those as, as I go through the presentation, but the presentation's gonna be probably pretty short, about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at most. And so once I'm done with that, I'll work my way through the questions in the chat to answer any questions that have come up. Great, if you'll excuse me just for one second, I'm gonna see if I can take over as presenter. And I'm going to show, let's just show Google here. I think that would be a good way to do it and show that window. Great. Okay, so I'm hoping, uh, in fact, let's try to get a little bit of interaction here and just test the tech. Uh, would you mind just uh, dropping in anyone and just typing in the chat to uh, either organizers only or to myself or to everyone if you have that option? and just uh, say hi, uh, and let me know whether you uh, can you see the screen. Just want to make sure that you're seeing the screen and that there is some mechanism for people to kind of ask questions, provide feedback, things like that. So if anyone could go into the chat window, maybe all of you, just take a second to say hi. Uh, let's just make sure that we've got that working and a mechanism for you to say, oh, I got a bunch of highs in the question section, so that looks great. Perfect. Looks like we'll be using questions, so we will do that. Great, so as I mentioned, my name is Peter Bale. I'm the head online instructor here, so I run the online instructional team, which is uh, a range of different roles now. We have educational coaches, program mentors, uh, working on hiring a technical community manager, section leads, uh, a bunch of different people who are all in the business of helping people who sign up with this program to build the skills required to get a job successfully as a junior software developer as quickly and easily as possible. Before this, I did a bunch of things. I ran engineering at General Assembly. I was CTO of a number of tech startups. I created books and videos for Thinkful and One Month and O'Reilly and Pearson and a bunch of other organizations. But about a year and a half ago, I got the chance to join Flatiron School to focus on building online instruction and saying, how can we make transformative education, not like, oh, I'd like to do an evening class, but hey, I want to change my career and get a new job, potentially. How can we make transformative education accessible to a wide range of people, irrespective of their geographic location, or even within reason, their time commitment? So as you'll see later in this uh, deck, we're going to talk about how some people are working 20 hours a week, some people are working 80 hours a week. There are a number of different ways of engaging with the curriculum and the instructional resources to build the skills that would allow you to get a job as a developer if you wanted to. So I'll start at the bottom with the in-person learning style, which is uh, at Flatiron School we offer in-person immersives. And those are a chance to, you, you come into New York City and it's a chance to work full time with a group of people completely focused on changing your life and your career as quickly as possible. And what's great about that is it's one of the quickest ways to, to change your career. If you are in a position that you either live in or near New York City, or you can get there, if you have the f flexibility in your life that you can kind of just drop everything for 12 or 15 weeks and take one of those courses, it's a very quick and effective way to kind of immerse yourself in this new lifestyle and learn to code quickly. 
I work with the online team, so we find that uh, we're often dealing with people, often we're dealing with people who uh, have life circumstances that make it impractical for them just to drop everything, move to New York City and commute to a campus five days a week. Uh, some people, it's just they live a long way away and the costs of traveling and, and staying in New York make it unrealistic. For other people, they have a job or family commitments or other life commitments that just mean it's not practical for them to kind of up stakes and, and focus on taking an immersive. So the great thing about the online course is that it gives you a lot more flexibility. And you know, we have times where people are working on it three, five, eight hours a week, but generally you want to take 20 hours a week or more because if you can't find 20 hours a week, it's just going to take a really long time to get through the curriculum. It's harder in some ways because what you need to do is you have to have the motivation to be able to be clear about your goals. Why am I sitting in front of the computer learning this when it's a beautiful sunny day outside? You have to schedule the time, actually put blocks of time on your calendar. And then you need to protect that time. Do I want to code? Or maybe I should just check Facebook. So it's important to take the, to, it's, it's to have a degree of motivation. And one of the things we're actually working on now is we're rolling out an educational coaching program, which is uh, every student when they join the program within the next three or four weeks is going to start getting assigned an educational coach who's specifically designed. They're not technical. We have plenty of technical resources, but the educational coaches are there just to help you to be clear about your goals, to be realistic. Oh, I'm working two hours a week and want to graduate in three months. That's one of those two things is not going to happen, right? You can't just work two hours a week and complete the course in three months. That's not realistic. And to help you to schedule and protect time, to be accountable, and to keep engaged and motivated in the program. The nice thing though is as long as you have that degree of motivation, it's an incredibly flexible way of learning. We have uh, instructors available to answer questions and help you with labs and lessons and the content from nine o'clock in the morning Eastern time to one o'clock in the morning Eastern time. So almost all day, seven days a week. So that means no matter whether you're working nights or mornings or lunch times or full times during the day, there's almost always an instructor online and available to help you. And so it gives you the flexibility of fitting this program around your schedule and around your life and possibly around your physical location. One of the nice things about the instructional team for online is we are working in the same way as you're learning. I'm calling you right now from sunny Boulder, Colorado, and we've got section leads in Tennessee, in California, in Florida, and technical coaches all across the country, and we're looking at how we can scale that so eventually we have them all around the world. In terms of the kinds of things you learn, uh, this is actually based on the immersive course, but it, it overlaps. The, the actual labs you take and the things you learn are almost identical between the online and in-person courses. In fact, the online course is actually a little bit more comprehensive. There's actually more stuff in the online course than there is in the in-person course, but we're currently going through and kind of tailoring the curriculum until eventually they will probably within the next three or four months be absolutely identical. So it really won't matter whether you learn in person or online, you will be able to have the same uh, educational experiences and capabilities at the end. To start with, we actually kick off uh, a little bit with some Ruby to get you used to an object-oriented programming language. Uh, Ruby is a really great language. I, I've learned a bunch of programming languages over the years, probably 10 or 12 of them. And Ruby is my favorite because in addition to being a very pragmatic choice, there are plenty of jobs for Ruby developers. It's also a really uh, nice introduction to how you should think about programming well. There are lots of people in the community who care about writing good software, and that's important because it allows you to build good habits and to build the kinds of skills that will get you onto a great engineering team, uh, not a bad one. Uh, one of the things that I consistently notice is that there are kind of two types of engineering teams that you can work for if you want to become a software developer. One is the, it's just a great team. Generally, there's a good work-life balance. Uh, generally, there's, there's a, a lot of enjoyment in the work. 
people are usually doing things like test driving their code, so they're writing tests for, for their code. And they're using best practices, which mean it might seem like they got a little slower, but they actually can add more functionality more quickly, and they never get to that point where they're so scared of their own code that they have to kind of throw it away and start from scratch. And then there are the other engineering teams. The ones where uh, like people are kind of hacking things together and we don't have time to write tests and we don't need tests anyway because we write code perfectly, but they don't. Um, and generally you kind of get the, you know, you kind of get these uh, pager or equivalent of pager duty so that it like hits you up on your cell phone in the middle of the night if the app breaks, which it does because you didn't write tests. And I find that if you can build the right kinds of skills, it will be attractive to one of the great engineering teams that kind of sets you up for a really great career because you spend two, three years on one of those and then you're in a really great position to take your pick of opportunities in the software development world. Uh, so anyway, we start you with a little bit of Ruby and then we cover front-end technologies, the stuff you actually see in your browser. So in Chrome or Safari or whatever you use, you see a page there, it's made up of HTML, the hypertext markup language, that's the way you put these little angle brackets around stuff to tell the browser, this is a head and this is a bulleted list and here's an image, go make it look pretty. And CSS, cascading style sheets, which is how you actually take those words and those kind of tags of markup and make them look a particular way so that you can uh, have background images and you can set the fonts and the font size and the spacing and all of those kinds of things. We also take the time to uh, run you through a procedural and object-oriented Ruby and get you to the point where you build your first portfolio project online. And the portfolio project is where you get the way that our curriculum is set up is you do a bunch of lessons. There's about 700 lessons, and about half of them are labs, and half of them are readmes. So read me, you read the text, look at the images, watch the video, and you're like, okay, I think that makes sense. And then quite often we'll have a lab after it where we give you some broken code, and you need to go fix the code and practice what you learned in the earlier labs, uh, in the earlier lessons. So it's a really good chance for you to get kind of hands-on and to solve one problem at a time so you can really focus on the details of uh, the CSS box model or how to use instance variables in Ruby or whatever it might be. But the, the strength of those labs is that they allow you to focus on one thing at a time the weakness of them is that then if all you ever did was the readme's and labs, if, you were, if somebody came to you and said, hey, I want you to go build me a website, you'd be like, okay, give me the broken one. You wouldn't actually know where to start. So what we do is we give you five portfolio projects uh, which serve an, a number of goals. The first thing they do is they allow you to have the experience of building something from scratch here. Go build a CLI, a command line interface, Ruby app, so a little piece of Ruby that you kind of type words in and it does stuff and pulls information down from the web and displays it on the screen. Then we get you to build a Sinatra app, a Rails app, Rails with jQuery, and finally React, which is a front-end JavaScript framework. And what these portfolio projects allow you to do is have the experience of building something from scratch. They also allow us to make sure that we do a portfolio project review where the instructional team, someone from our team actually runs you through and asks you questions. And we make sure that you really meet the technical requirements. Do you actually understand what you're talking about and can you communicate it in an effective way? And can you do just a little bit of live coding, right? You didn't just get your cousin to go build this thing. If we ask you to write a little bit of code or change a feature or add some functionality, you can do that yourself. And this is perfect because it turns out that firstly, if you want to be a developer, uh, while uh, you look in the movies, developers are, you know, kind of overweight dudes with glasses, like sitting in a darkened basement. Uh, that's actually not software development at all. Uh, it's primarily about talking to people. It's primarily about communicating with business stakeholders and other developers to figure out what and how your code should do. So first thing is just practicing talking about your code and perhaps even live coding and tweaking stuff is a really good practice for a job as a developer. Perhaps even more importantly though, by doing that, it's also exactly what you need to do to get a job as a developer because typically what will happen is you reach out to a company and if there seems to be some interest, they will ask you to do a technical interview. And often that will involve 
explaining code and or writing code with them, either online or in person. So getting the experience of doing that online gives you the flexibility and the skills required so that you'll be ready to apply for and get a job as a developer by the end of the course, if that's what you want. So if module one is the programming fundamentals, we then go into web frameworks. We take time to introduce something that I mentioned a moment ago called Sinatra, which is a very lightweight, simple web framework in the Ruby programming language. A framework is just a, a set of pre-built code that allows you to go build common things more quickly than starting everything from scratch. And then once you've got the basic principles of something called an MVC or model view controller architecture, and you understand the basics of connecting to a database, then we move you on to Rails, which is probably one of the most popular frameworks out there for quickly building powerful web applications. I've been involved with a number of startups and for my last three or four startups, we all used Rails, it's, it's pretty common. And that will then give you the job readiness skills that you need so that you can get into a startup or a more established company and get a job as a junior Rails developer. We then move on to JavaScript, the, the language du jour, which is, is kind of funny because I remember I'd been programming web stuff for, for a while, I guess I started in about 96, so geez, 21 years ago. And um, the interesting thing about JavaScript is in many ways it's not, a, it's not that great a language. It's certainly not the easiest language to learn first. It has lots of kind of unusual features, at least in part because Brendan Eich, the guy who wrote it, actually built the first version of it in under 10 days. And the goal back then in, in the uh, early to mid 90s was just to have like this throw together language for making stuff move on web page until Java servlets really took off, which was what everyone thought was gonna happen, which was different programming language, a different tech, and not the way the world worked. So we feel that Ruby is a much better language for you to learn the fundamentals of programming, but then the good news is once you've done that, when we introduce you to JavaScript, you can then see the differences, and now you're starting to build perhaps one of the most important skills you could have as a professional developer the ability to understand the distinction between different types of languages so you can decide. Um, you might get a job and end up programming in Elixir, or Go, or Java, or Groovy, or of course you could be doing mobile stuff using Swift. There's many, many languages out there, and you'll find that by learning two fully-fledged programming languages in this course, you'll find it much easier in the future to jump to new languages that you will probably have to learn. Because if you're looking at a long-term career and if you're relatively young, if you're still gonna be programming in 20 years, I don't know what you're gonna be coding in, but I hope it's neither Ruby nor JavaScript. Hopefully we'll have something better by then. So we take the time to run you through the principles of JavaScript, the basics of making stuff move on the page in your web app, right up to creating single page applications using frameworks like React. And that's module four where we run you through all of the details of what is probably the, uh, these days, the most popular front end framework uh, created by Facebook, React. It's a really great way for creating truly interactive web applications. Then we have some optional material at the end. Uh, we take a little bit of time to, we, we give you access to resources related to algorithms and data structures and you get to work with a career coach once you hit 75% of the way through the program. So it's a really good opportunity to build all of the skills required to pass a technical interview and get a job, uh, as well as knowing that you've learned the programming fundamentals you need to be able to deliver uh, kind of applications day one once you get that job. Another nice part of the program is that going through the program, you actually get to build a portfolio. Uh, first, you get to build lots of little labs and projects, but you specifically get to build these five portfolio projects. So you can actually show people an application running that you've built and answer questions about it. And another thing we, we ask uh, all of the students to do is to blog on a fairly regular basis because that uh, helps you to improve your ability to communicate about coding. And it also shows a degree of interest. Certainly if I'm ever, whenever I was a CTR, I was looking to hire a developer, one of the first things I would do is look at their social media presence, look at their blogs, and 
I wasn't looking, you know, if I'm looking for a junior developer, I don't need them to have come up with some idea that nobody else has ever thought about in the field of computer science. But I'd love to see just a 500, 800 word write up about a gem they recently used, a, a pre-written piece of software in Ruby, and uh, what their experiences was with it, and some hints and tips for getting going quickly. And so it, it's important to take the time to build that blog so that you have a portfolio of both code and writing that shows your fitness for development position. When I think about pace and scheduling, everyone goes at a different pace, and some people go faster and slower, even using the same number of hours. But in general time, we have people who are doing this kind of on a part-time basis, right? They've got family responsibilities, <laughs> excuse me, family responsibilities, maybe uh, they've got a, a part-time or even a full-time job that they're hoping to, to move along from. And so we absolutely have people who take this program and graduate. It says 10 plus months, it's really all over the place. It, it's usually about a year, it can be a year and a half if you're working 20 to, to 25 hours a week. Uh, but it's a great way if you have no way of just saying I'm gonna take four or six months of my life to devote to this, of continuing to meet your life obligations whilst investing in being able to transform your life and career by becoming a developer. We also have a good number of students who take this on a full-time basis, and so it takes six plus months, sometimes it's six, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's nine, and these are people who are working you know, around a 40-hour week. They're kind of treating this like their day job because they want to, just like you would go to college for a year or two, they're gonna take six or 12 months to build the skills required to get a job as a developer. We also have some people who do more than that. We have some people who are working 60 or 80 hour weeks and we've had people blow through the program in three or four months. Uh, so it's possible to do the program in a similar amount of time as you would do an immersive, but you have to work at a similar pace. You're gonna be putting in 60 or 70 hour weeks and you've got to be using that time effectively. Talking of using the time effectively, we have a number of educational resources that we provide to help you out. And the very first one you should look at is the one-on-one -on -one educational support. There's a button when you join the learn.co program that says ask new question. Click on it early and often. If you're working on a lab, you've just been stuck for 10 minutes, if you have no idea where to go next, it's the same as putting your hand up in a class and asking for the TA to come over. Click the button, let somebody know what your problem is. Now, Sometimes you'll get an immediate, you'll always get a, an answer almost always within a minute or so. Uh, if you need a screen share, like a one-on-one -on -one session with one of our technical coaches, all of whom are graduates of the program, they've all gone through the program, they've all done the labs, that sometimes it will take two minutes, sometimes it will take 30 or 45. So make sure to like, kind of click the ask a question button early so that if there's a little bit of a wait, you can kind of keep Googling and you don't get too frustrated, but use that early and often. Occasionally we have students who take two weeks and then they're like, you know, I spent two weeks in the lab and I finally clicked to ask a question. I'm like, why? There's 300 labs. If you take two weeks off for each one, this is gonna take you forever. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be staring at a screen wondering what to do for like an hour. If you get stuck for 10 minutes, click the button and within, usually within 20 or 30 minutes, you'll have a screen share one-on-one -on -one for 20 minutes with one of our instructors who can help you to get going again. And again, that's flexible anytime between nine o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the morning Eastern time. You also get one-on-one -on -one support in terms of the five portfolio project reviews where one of the section leads, and I'll talk about all these roles in a moment, uh, but one of the kind of senior instructors will work with you to give you feedback and ask you questions and kind of prepare you to build the skills you need to get a job as a developer and then to perform that job. And then we also have onboarding and, and mentoring and one-on-one -on -one sessions that we're building out both with technical staff and soon with non-technical staff if it's just kind of a motivational issue to make sure that you can connect with people and get the help you need to move through the program. But learning isn't uh, a solitary activity and it's not just about connecting with uh, your
your instructor. We also have a whole bunch of group educational activities. We now run, um, start of the summer, we're running like eight study groups a week. We now run 40 or more study groups every single week and we deliberately run some of them evenings and weekends to make sure that people who are working full time in their time zone can still access some of these uh, office hours, uh, live lectures and other resources. We have office hours which is like, come up with your question. Not only will you hopefully get your question answered, but you'll also hear other people asking and answering questions and you'll learn a lot about how an experienced programmer thinks just by the questions they ask of the students who are coming for help. So office hours are worth attending even if you don't have a problem yourself. We also have live lectures where we will uh, go through a lab and show you how uh, somebody who's done it before would think about solving the problem. We'll cover a concept that we find, where there's a number of concepts we find that people often get stuck with, so we'll take the time to go through those. Uh, we also have portfolio project prep uh, study groups, which is you're just about to work on your project and you have no idea what to do or you're stuck with it. Again, a chance to connect with other people who are solving exactly that same kind of set of problems and to get feedback from an instructor and from your peers. And then we also just do kind of motivational, like Thoughtful Thursday and Woeful Wednesday, a chance just to connect with other students going through the program. And while at first it might be like, really, I'm going to waste one of my precious 20 hours of learning on connecting with other students, turns out that that's one of the best investments you can make. When we look for the things that are most correlated with success in the program, it's almost always engaging in Slack, which is uh, an asynchronous chat tool, which you can, or a synchronous chat tool as well, which you can use to connect with other students in the program, turning up to the study groups and using ask a question early and often. This is, apologies, this is a slightly outdated slide. Uh, we, we've had uh, having a few changes at the moment, but we do have uh, three section leads. We've got Luke, uh, Corinna, and Cernan, who are responsible for helping you through the various sections. And we're actually just hiring a new section lead over the next week or so. So uh, soon we'll have actually five, because we're, we're bringing somebody from the in-person team to also join as a lead section lead. We've got a couple of program mentors who are students who are going through the program themselves who will onboard you and be there for you in Slack to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, the managing technical coach for all has now been taken by Ruth, that is uh, not Ruth's picture in the bottom left, and uh, she's responsible for hiring and managing a team of over 20 part-time technical coaches who staff ask a question and help out with uh, study groups, and one-on-one -on -one sessions to help you to get the instructional support you need when you need it. That's a picture of myself, the head learn instructor, and then we've got Joe Burgess, who is the VP of education, who deals uh, with both online and in person, and then Avi Flombaum, who founded the school. So he's the, the dean, and you'll often see him chum, uh, dropping in and out of chat. But the one takeaway I would have with uh, with this slide, this instructional support, is we've got a lot of resources. We have uh, close to 35 people now, and we're just about to have a lot more people joining the team as we scale this out. And all of our goal is to help you to get through this program as quickly and as effectively as possible. I've been building online educational solutions and uh, teaching developers for more than a decade now. I, I said I created a, a book for O'Reilly and a video series for Pearson and content for Code School and Thinkful and I used to teach at GA. And what I found across all of that was that the missing piece was a comprehensive set of instructional resources that would support the curriculum, the stuff you look at, and the labs, the kind of automated tests that give you real-time feedback whether it's working, to allow you to really progress as quickly as possible but on your own schedule and in your own home rather than having to turn up to a particular place at a particular time. And one of the things I'm really excited about at Flatiron is we've now got the resources required to invest in building out all those, uh, those roles and those support systems to help you to take the course and then build the skills you'd need to get a job as a junior developer. So that's me. Uh, what I want to do now is I'm going to open up to uh, questions and to chat. So I see some highs which I'm just going to get rid of.
Glad to see those are, are good. Beautiful, got a bunch of those. If uh, anyone has access to chat, I know sometimes depending on how GoToWebinar is configured, you may or may not be able to. Please do feel to uh, feel free to send a message to organizers, all if you have access to that. Or just if you have a question, you can also use the, the question feature. And if you'll excuse me, it's just taking me a second to get rid of all of the highs. Serves me right for asking like 88 people whether they could see something. And okay, I'm now starting to get into some questions. So what I'm gonna do uh, for the remaining time is make my way through these questions kind of from the top down as, as quickly and concisely as I can. What I'm probably gonna do is try to go on, on and be as brief as I can in the answers. So that way if there's any thing that you wanna follow up on, please just throw another question at the bottom. I don't promise to get to all the questions, but I'll get to as many as I can. And let me just say that if you find yourself with questions after this, uh, I'm putting my email into the chat, peter at flatironschool.com. Please feel free to drop me a line, just cut and paste a question into that before the webinar ends, and I'll do my very best to respond to you as quickly as I can. If I get 200 emails, it's gonna take a while because today's all meetings, but I will get back to you uh, certainly within this week and hopefully more quickly if I can. So, um, after completing the course, will students be able to get a full-time job or you recommend that we invest two to three years working with your engineering team? Uh, the goal of this program, the vast majority of people who take it, I, I, I should clarify, there are probably some people on this webinar who are designers and would just like some front-end development skills or product managers who just want to understand what those weird programmers are doing. Or maybe they're an entrepreneur who's like, if only I could build my own minimum viable product. And to all of those people, we, we extend a hearty welcome. Uh, we have learners of many types, but we find more than 80% of our students are looking to get a job as a software developer. They're looking to get a, a career as a professional software developer. And uh, because of that, we build the program to give you the skills to get a job. You're gonna start working with a career coach once you're about three quarters of the way through the program. And uh, we have a, a we have a really great team and we've had really great success. You should absolutely check, download our jobs report from the website to get all of the details and the statistics. But we do a really good job of helping our students to get jobs. So you do not need to work with us for two or three years. Uh, you should take the course and then go get a job as a developer, assuming that's what you want to do. If you're enrolled in the online program but can make it into NYC from time to time, would it be possible to get help or support in person or on campus? Well, so the, the first thing I'll say is if you do have access, you do have access to the New York City campus, and uh, it's a little early to be specific, but uh, we are hoping, hoping, hoping to open this up to, to more than just New York City eventually. Um, yes, you can absolutely drop into the campus. At the moment, all of our technical coaches are also online, so you could get help in person in the campus, but effectively you'd be hanging out in the campus speaking with somebody in Tennessee. Uh, it's quite possible that over time we will consider placing technical coaches in some of the campuses, so if you do want to actually rock up and attend a study group in person, do a one-on-one -on -one in person, or even just ask a question in person, the technical coaches will be facilitating that through both in-person and online experiences, but at the moment, you have access to the campus, but at the moment, uh, all of the technical coaches are still remote. Uh, stay tuned for that. I would expect that to change within the next few months. The difference between the free uh, pre-boot camp versus boot camp, is the interface the same? That's a great question. Um, there's also a question about whether the person could set up a phone meeting with someone who's completed the prep and the actual boot camp both. I don't know how to, I, I think there might be some practical issues around that, so I don't know whether I'd be able to set you up with uh, a phone call there. I'll be honest, I know less about the uh, pre-course materials than I should. One, I know that there is a course specifically designed to give you the skills required uh, to, to be ready to attend a boot camp, whether it's our online one, our in-person one, or somebody else's. And I know we have a number of other free courses. The thing I would suggest is definitely the same interface, it's just different curriculum, it works in the same way. So try the various courses and see which one or which ones fit you best. Definitely take the time to use the free courses and use that as a reality check. If you sign up for a free course and you never complete more than a lab, 
probably not worth spending money with us because you're probably never going to get through the course. Um, but if you do take those labs and you like the process and you like using Ask a Question, which is available in our free tracks, uh, then you should definitely do that and then think whether an online or in-person program from either Flatiron or someone else might be the right way for you to move forward. Someone's asked, how would the acquisition from WeWork affect perfect, uh, prospective students? That's a great question, and we're, we're figuring out all the details, but only positively. Uh, clearly, one of the things we want to do is we want to work with WeWork to allow our graduates to be able to access their many member companies that are looking for technical staff. So I think it's going to continue to help with the breadth of career opportunities. It's also uh, clearly WeWork has lots of physical spaces, and there are regulatory and other issues we need to deal with on a state by state and country by country basis. But clearly, we would like to be able to provide uh, in-person education. Uh, and immersives like we do in New York City, above and beyond New York City. And then in terms of online, one thing I, I can definitively say is we've just been doing some staff planning meetings and we're going to have additional resources. We're going to be able to invest. We were kind of scrappy at Flatiron School. Uh, we raised some money, but we're kind of self-funded and we're never quite sure where the next dollar was coming from. So we, we wanted to make sure we were cash flow positive. Uh, with WeWork, we have more resources and we're going to be investing those in continuing to improve every aspect of the student experience from curriculum to product to instruction. So uh, nothing but good things and I'm, I'm certainly personally super excited about what's going to come from the acquisition. Besides SQL, do students learn any other database languages? So it's interesting. I used to, there, there are many different databases, right? It's the piece of software used to store a bunch of information. So then if you have a website, you can store your users and your pages and links to the images and courses they've attended or whatever it might be. Uh, SQL, Structured Query Language, is the most popular programming language uh, for databases. And so that is the language we teach you. And then we also teach you some tools on top of that, specifically Active Record in Rails, which allows you to write less code but get the same outcome. We do not cover MongoDB, Redis, uh, Neo4j, or, or many of the other NoSQL databases as part of the course. They are awesome technologies. Uh, I used to be a MongoDB master. I'm, I love the team over at Mongo. Uh, there are lots of great elements in those technologies, but they're much they're they're specifically applicable to very specific problem domains. So definitely take the time to learn them after the course. But what we want to do is give you the fundamental skills required to get a great job as a junior developer. So we do not focus on additional database tools or languages. Are there any job support services after the online courses? Absolutely. So we provide the same career services to online and in-person students. Uh, Rebecca Rombom runs that department, and it breaks down into two groups. There's a business development side that primarily works with companies saying, hey, hire our graduates, learn more about how our graduates have written great software for people and why they're really good value and a great way to, to staff out your engineering team. And then there's a career services team which provide career coaching on things like technical interviews and writing cover letters and applying to um, employers and a really important, like when Adam and Avi first founded the, the Flatiron School, their goal was transformative education and their focus was on outcomes. Uh, they, I think they think it's ridiculous that a three-year college can charge you money and they're not guaranteed a, a job at the end or at least you know, give you your money back if you're unable to get a job. So they've been very focused on career services for both online and in-person students. And again, download the jobs report. That reflects exactly uh, how people are doing when they get out of this program. But it is a, there is absolutely a, a set of, of resources available for career services and, and they're doing a great job in helping our graduates to get the jobs they want. I don't know, it's just acquired by WeWorks. Acqu acquisitions can be a bit messy. Was wondering if it'll have any effect on the program. Nothing but good. Uh, we're continuing operating as normal whilst making new plans, uh, which hopefully we'll announce over the next few months, that will allow us to improve both in-person and online capabilities and access. So there's lots of great things in the pipeline that we are finalizing now. But in the meantime, we're just focusing on 
everything we're doing before the acquisition, which is continuing to improve the quality of instruction, curriculum, product, and career services. How does a free boot camp help with the actual program? Well, uh, what's nice about, it's like, look, you, when you start with learn.co, there are kind of two options. You can start giving us money or you can like learn some stuff without giving us money. I'm always a fan of not giving people money until I have to. So try some of the, try some of the free resources. You're going to learn programming skills that relate to the things you need to learn uh, if you decide to join the paying course. So sign up for a free boot camp or another resource like that to work your way through the course to see what you, how you like it. Click on ask a question. See what the experience is of having a technical coach there when you need them to screen share with you and give you a hand when you get stuck. And we find that most of the people who joined the program did indeed do one of the free courses first and liked it so much that they realized that was the way they wanted to learn online. What about a boot camp versus an actual actual bachelor's degree program? Well, that, that's, that's a fascinating question. I don't want to wade too deeply into it. Um, I think they're solving very, very different problems. If I was 18 years old, I had no job experience and I was coming out of high school, uh, if I had the, the ability financially and, and, and otherwise to do it, it's a great experience uh, to attend a, a three-year college and to, to have that experience. It doesn't necessarily depend on the course you take, give you the skills to get a job, and it can be very expensive and it's, it's a large amount of time. Uh, certainly if, if I had a three-year college degree and now I was at some point in my life where um, I'm doing a job that I'm not super psyched about, I think a course like Flatirons is a great way to very quickly gain the vocational skills you need to succeed. So in the short term, I don't know that uh, a, a six to 12 month course in uh, full stack web development is yet a replacement for college, but stay tuned. We would certainly love to provide a wider range of services and a wider range of curriculum that would be a genuine and incredible college replacement. Can I get a copy of the PDF, the slide deck? Uh, yes, I don't quite know how to do that, uh, but I'm gonna check in with the uh, marketing team and I'll figure out if, if they can figure out a way to get it to you. Worst case, uh, if you could just send an email to peter at flatironschool.com, I'll confirm with marketing it's okay and I'll send you out a copy of the deck sometime tonight. Do we learn about deploying websites and uh, running tests automatically on deployed websites? It's a great question. Uh, the challenge with learning about deployment is that it's a whole other thing. Our job in this program is to give you just enough skills that uh, I as a CTO could go hire you, bring, bring you onto my, my team at whatever my startup or enterprise is and get value from you. Uh, to do that, we focus on Ruby on the back end and HTML, CSS and JavaScript on the front end. And that's enough skill consistently that people will hire you and give you a job. Once you've done that, the learning only begins. There's a lot more learning to do above and beyond just the stuff required to get the job. Uh, the reason we don't cover AWS or Heroku, the reason we don't formally include test-driven development and RSpec and Jasmine and Mocha and Jest and all the rest in our curriculum is because then it would be twice as long as a curriculum and we want you to get out because <laughs> the magic secret is you're gonna be learning all day every day as a developer. There's no day when you're just gonna rock up as a developer and be like, oh, I now know all the codes and I don't need to learn anything new. Because just as soon as you think that's true, new programming language, new framework, new tools, new build systems, new deployment tools, new databases will come out and prove you wrong. So what we try to do is take a subset of the skills uh, that you would need if you were, say, running an engineering team or building one from scratch and give you the skills to get your foot in the door. Because once you've got your foot in the door, then you're being paid to learn instead of paying to learn. And that's a much better position to be in. Next question, does the NYC campus offer a night curriculum? At the moment, we do not have an evenings and week, an evenings and or evenings and weekends curriculum. It's one of the many things we're considering. Uh, I, I can't say whether that's going to launch and if so, when. So at the moment, if you want to learn other than full-time immersive, online is, is the resource that we provide at Flatiron to allow you to do that. 
After finishing the courses, are there any resources to learn the new languages like Unity uh, for, for game and VR programming and Python, which is great for web development and for data science? We have some additional curriculum that we share with you, uh, primarily around algorithms and uh, resources that will help you to get a job. There is a world full of resources around other programming languages and frameworks and tools. At the moment, we're just focused on transformative education, which is helping people to get a job as a developer, even though they're not currently a developer. So right now, we don't have all of that curriculum. Uh, but Hopefully, we'll get you connected with the right employer, and then they will give you access to resources like that to keep learning after you graduate. If you've applied for a scholarship, how long does it take to get a decision? That's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I am not as I run the online instructional team, but I don't run admissions or, for that matter, career services. So, um, sorry to say, I don't know the answer. But if you'd like to drop me a line, Peter at FlatIronSchool.com. I will ask the question and get you an answer, uh, certainly before tomorrow morning. Will any type of computer work to complete the free courses and possibly the paid course? Uh, we try to be really, really flexible. Um, if you have the financial means and the, the option, get yourself a Mac. It's, uh, it's going to save you all kinds of trouble. And this is not about Flatiron School or uh, about a particular boot camp or online versus in person. If you want to become a programmer, most programmers use Macintosh computers these days. If you can get one, get one secondhand, get one refurbished, try to do that. If that's just not economically feasible or if that doesn't fit with your, your life for whatever other reason, uh, Windows machines are fine. You'll probably have to install Linux on it at some point in time. But all of our free and paid programs are designed that you can go uh, through all of the free program and a good part of the paid program just using a regular Windows or Macintosh computer, not a Chromebook, sorry, uh, Windows or Macintosh computer or Linux if you happen to have that. And then you don't need to buy a, a new computer to finish the program. You just have to install the Linux operating system as you get further through the professional paid program because you're going to need to learn how to work with uh, a Unix-based operating system to get a job as a developer in most places, certainly if you're using Ruby and JavaScript. What is the acceptance rate for the online program? Again, a great question. Again, sorry, I do not know the answer to that, but if you drop me a line, I will try to find out and get the answer to you uh, later today. How does Community Powered Bootcamp compare to the online web developer program? So the goal of Community Powered Bootcamp is to provide a very inexpensive way that if you know what you're doing, you just need the readmes and you just need the labs, and you just want to take that as inexpensively as possible, it's a way to do that. Uh, and the goal is to build a community around that so that there are people who are also going through the course who can help you to answer your questions. The challenge is you have no instructional resources at all. We're like, hey, here's the software, here's the code, and we have people who complete CPB and, uh, and can go through the program and can learn that way, which is great. I've found that many, many students find having instructional resources, one-on-ones, uh, study groups, all of these things, to be a really compelling part of the experience. So uh, I'm a fan of online instruction, which is why I run an online instructional team. So I'm definitely biased in this. Uh, but I think the, the, the big difference is instructional resources. Hey, if you can do CPB and it just works for you, don't waste the money on the more expensive course. But I find that almost everyone wants and needs the support of instructors to help them to get through the program. It's the difference between buying the books that you would study at Berkeley or going to Berkeley and being in the discussion groups and being there with the lecturers. That's the difference. I have a hard time studying a boot camp in English, so can I learn this uh, in, in another language? At the moment, we have no immediate plans to localize the language in which uh, the human languages in which we teach programming. The reason for that is we're primarily focused on getting people jobs. Uh, we're primarily focused in doing that in the US. We do not currently have the resources to get somebody a job in uh, Thailand or you know, United Arab Emirates or somewhere like that. So uh, for the vast majority of jobs in the United States, a fluency in English 
such that you can uh, talk about code successfully is a prerequisite for the job. So because of that, uh, I'm not sure that it would help us to help people to change their lives to get jobs as programmers in the US primarily uh, by localizing this. Of course, if we get to the position where we have the resources to provide career services in multiple countries and some of those are not English speaking, we would, I would imagine, reevaluate that decision. Do we provide support for graduates after they've been hired? Um, I'm not quite sure what it means in terms of support. Uh, we certainly have an active alumni network. People keep in touch with us and keep in touch with each other. We provide them continued access to the platform if they want to go and review resources. Uh, so we certainly do all of that. We feel like our job is to get you a job. We certainly feel like you're part of the Flatiron community forever and you can always reach out and we do our best to help you. Um, but our primary job is to get you your first job as a developer and then if we can do anything to help you from there, we will. Is there a difference between working uh, for a Mac versus a PC? Uh, so in short, Macintosh is kind of the best of both worlds in that it's relatively pretty and easy to use, at least once you get used to it. It's a bit of a, I made the shift from Windows, I don't know, about 10, 11 years ago, and it was a pain, and I hated everything on a Mac, and then I got over it in about two months, and then I started enjoying it. Um, but in addition to having a relatively pretty user interface and having lots of software available for it, things that aren't necessarily true of Linux, which is your other operating system choice, that's you know the software that runs the computer and speaks to the hard drive and connects to Wi-Fi and does all those things. The, the, the real power of a Mac is that it is based on top of Unix, which is uh, Linux is a type of Unix. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to do, to run the software and uh, to do things at a terminal window where you type little commands in, in the way that a professional programmer does. So your life is going to be easier, especially working with Ruby and JavaScript, if you work on a Mac. That said, I don't have the exact stats, but I would guess half or more than half of our students have a PC, uh, just because, right, they're cheaper and it's easier and why wouldn't you have one? Uh, so if you have a Windows PC, that's absolutely fine. You can definitely get through the course doing that, and I would say probably the majority of our students do. What is the admissions process? Again, that's a great question. If you could drop me a line to peter at flatironschool.com, I, uh, I can send you a little more information. Uh, but basically, you, there, you should, there should be a resource for, um, you know what? I, I don't want to misspeak on this, so drop me a line and I'll try to find out more information, but you should find, uh, if you take Community Bad Bootcamp or if you inquire through the website, that somebody will reach out to you and run you through the process. Uh, certainly, if you want to find out more about uh, getting admitted, if you don't find another easy way to do it, drop me a line and I'll make sure to connect you to the right person or people within Flatiron. And then what about accreditation and certification? Do we help you to get a certification? Well, we, we, so we have a, um, it, it's really interesting. So I taught uh, digital literacy as an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School for a number of years. And one of the challenges with accredited curriculum is that Generally, it's rather slow moving. It's kind of hard to get accreditation bodies to keep up with the latest technology. If you were to say to an accreditation body, cool, so this is a curriculum now, but we're going to be changing it every month or so. They'd be like, wait, you've got to go through this whole process each time. Uh, but to do so makes it really hard to keep up with the latest versions and the latest technologies and the latest things. So because of that, we focus on what we think really matters. Why, why, the question is, why does somebody want a, a certification or accreditation or something else? Uh, most of the people we've speak and spoken to want a degree or a certification or accreditation to get them a job in the field. So we kind of cut to the chase and say, how about we just help you to get a job and build the reputation by making sure that graduates of Flatiron School are really good at what they do, that when you tell people you graduated from the Flatiron School, whether in person or online, they'll be like, wow, you know, I've hired a bunch of Flatiron grads, we should at least have an interview and have a chat. So right now our focus is primarily on transformative education and getting people outcomes. Uh, 
while still being like certified as a school, but we're not focused on getting like third party accreditation of specific, uh, you know, like to get your degree or something like that. Oh, and in fact, somebody said uh, the enrollment team will be doing a webinar on Thursday, same time as this, that's 1026, so it's in two days. So definitely if you want to learn a little more about how enrollments work, uh, you, should, uh, you should check out that webinar, it'll be a great resource. And currently, final question, how long does it usually take to complete the prep work you provide before the paid boot camp? That's a great question, and uh, apologies, and unfortunately, that's also one that I'm not familiar with. I clearly am going to have to do uh, some more uh, prep work myself on the, my 100% my focus for the last 18 months has been how can we improve the instruction for the students we have in, in the online program. So unfortunately, that's my focus. I don't know how long that prep work takes on average, but if you drop me a line, I'll check in with Joe, uh, who is, uh, would have a much better answer to that, and I'll get you an answer. So Peter at flatironschool.com. And those are all the questions we have, and actually that's all the time we have. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, engage with this webinar. Please, if you have any extra questions, drop me a line, peter at flatironschool.com. Happy to answer all of them uh, the best way as I can. Otherwise, thank you all so much for taking the time. And who knows, maybe I look forward to seeing some of you in the program. Take care. Bye now.